every game. And there's a lot of talk about Manchester United coming up in PL Express. And it is time for PL Express now. We'll be starting this week's show with a bold take and getting your opinion on it, Yanish. And yes, it does include Manchester United. We're also going to be giving our thoughts on Liverpool and Spurs a little bit away from the VAR controversy because I feel as though it's dominated everything and understandably so. But let's focus on what we've learned about the teams. And you're going to give us your top five players in the Premier League right now, which I'm very much looking forward to. So let's start with that bold take then to kick things off. Manchester United are worse off now than they were under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Uh, no, no, Falcon and Solskjaer was still here. Uh, Manchester United would be playing in Conference League, uh, maybe. Um, uh, I mean, he was there long enough, right? I mean, uh, and and okay, one time he's brought him in, the, you know, he, they were in the Champions League, so give him due and one of the cup finals, if I remember correctly. But no, I mean, that obviously didn't work. I mean, he was the, you know, he was the opposite from Ten Hag, almost too nice, I suppose. Uh, we'll get to Ten Hag in a second, but I don't believe that would have been uh, the right choice. In terms of Ten Hag, uh, he's not beyond uh, criticism. Uh, I think I've been very positive on him because he gave us a reason. I mean, the first season was absolutely outstanding. And when we say first, first season, I mean, he got there when things were just about same as now, if not worse to a degree, right? So uh, a little bit of shock treatment was needed and now he's got to manage. And that's the criticism because uh, when you first, first get there, you know, you have to you you have to do a little bit of maintenance there. And that happened with Maguire. That happens with Ronaldo, maybe with some of the players. Then obviously he got some of his players uh, in. Those players are disappointing. And uh, you and I have voiced our opinion, uh, play, you know, players that are coming in that he were he was comfortable with because he had him, you know, at some stage at, at a divisie, be it at Utrecht or, or Ajax, obviously. And as we've said before, uh, you know, there's a massive, massive difference between the two leagues. And it shows. And I don't even want to name check all these players because you know who they are. And, and that's usually not the type of players that come to Manchester United. The question that I don't know about, because I'm not there, did he want them over some of the better players or... Are Manchester United not able to tie tie down the best players? Because I think part of it is true. I think the top top players don't want to come to Manchester United uh, anymore. It's as simple as that. We see it over, you know, we've been hearing about Harry Kane and you know Daniel Levy not wanting to sell to uh, to a competitor, money this or that. Who knows? Maybe Harry Kane said, "No, this is a bright old mess. I don't want to go there." I'm not guaranteed anything over there. I'm going to buy Munich. And that could have been a case with many other names that we've, we've heard over the summer because that's where Manchester United are at the moment. And I hope, and I know a lot of Manchester United uh, fans, and, and they're not kidding themselves. I hope there's not, you know, the, the people that I don't know, I hope they don't kid themselves thinking that Manchester United are what Manchester United once were because they're not. And I think we see a little bit of that. How to get them back. Well, it took Sir Alex Ferguson many, many years to establish Manchester United as one of the greatest clubs uh, in history, right? Uh, I hope that this Manchester United is not being brought down by yet another manager because, you know, to put everything on Ten Hag is unfair, of course, because they've had some great uh, coaches, just to men uh, mention Jose Mourinho as one of them. Um, so, yeah, it's not great, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a go at him. And, Kay, look, I mean... That shock treatment needs to continue, right? Because the boys were talking about, uh, you know, the players. Look, I want to see the leadership for Bruno Fernandes. I'm not sure I'm seeing it. There are games that he plays well, but leadership is a lot more than just playing well. Uh, you know, Rafael Veran, Casemiro, Rashford, gloves are off, right? I mean, if I think of him, the statute, statute of limitation has expired on him. He's 25 years old. And, and I think, you know, what we saw last season was great. We don't see that often enough. And I think, you know, to a degree, massive mistake of giving him a bumper deal last year. I know how he did that. He probably held him up for ransom uh, because it was easy to say, eh, I may, you know, I may want to go somewhere, somewhere. They knew how great he was last season, how much he's needed and how bad it would look if somehow Rashford wanted to leave. So he got extra money. Not seeing it right now. And and I think if you ten hack. Don't treat him with gloves uh, on uh, uh, because, because again, you're seeing, you know, we're back to Rashford that's uh, not really good and very inconsistent, uh, not to mention his body language, as everybody sees. 
Well, let's talk about as Zlatan Ibrahimovic talking about this very topic in a recent interview, saying, what is the experience of this coach? Young talents, he comes to United. It's a different mentality, different players. The players there are supposed to be big stars. He's in a different situation. I can imagine him coming from Ajax to United is a big difference because I've been in both clubs. Essentially, he's alluding to the fact that he's not managing big players well. Could be, I mean, look, Zlatan, you know, loves Jose Mourinho. I mentioned Jose Mourinho. They were there. Okay, Jose Mourinho, what did he want? Europa League, right? Jose Mourinho now is... He, well, he said, he said, Janish, as well, didn't he? He said that his biggest achievement was finishing second with his United side. And many people did roll their eyes and say it's so typically Mourinho to say that. But you can see what he meant. Yes, but no, I, I'll give you that. I, I think that maybe he is not experienced in that yet. But again... You know, they chose who they've chosen. I don't remember many other big names uh, banging around and saying, I want to go to United as managers. Uh, does Latan mention uh, a manager that wanted to be at United or should be in United? Those are two different stories, right? So uh, remember, you know, the, the, the season was already being played in. They decided to make a change. And at that time, you know, I, I, you know, forgive me here because I remember, I don't remember who the other names were, but, you know, I, I just don't know of many big time experienced managers that at the time uh, absolutely wanted to be at United. I, I could be found out wrong here because I just don't remember. But, you know, some of, some of, some of it is fair points. I just wish that Zlatan came out with that statement uh, last season when Eric Ten Hag came in and, and got Manchester United to the, to the Champions League spots, won the League Cup, and lost to Manchester City in the final. If Zlatan said that at that particular point, hats off. Now, eh. Yeah, it doesn't mean as much to you. But what about the players that Eric Ten Hag's brought in? What to make of what he's done here? Alessandro Martinez, Anthony, or Nana? Because obviously you do look at when a new manager comes in, the players that they've given the nod for and the players that they've said that they wanted. What's your assessment there? Well, I think I just said it. I, I just mentioned. I, I don't think those are the type of players that Manchester United should be going after because because there's there is a massive drop off, right? I mean, you know, uh, which player? You know, as I said, Onana. Let's give him some time. Not good enough right now. Remember, the hair wasn't wasn't either. Maybe he'll come good. Malasia, eh, again, not a player that I would envision at Manchester United. A player that makes a difference. Maybe for depth. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, Anthony, he was wonderful. He was very young. Give it to Zlatan. This was a very young team that uh, that kind of we looked at as Ajax great. We knew what they can do there. And from time to time, we knew that they could do it in the Champions League. But at the end of the day, we knew that ultimately it's not going to happen for them, right? So it's a different way of looking. They were not favorites ever to win anything. Manchester United historically is favorites to win all the trophies. And that that's that's a massive difference. Hoyland, again, I, I think I agree with Stevie. He's going to get better, but I don't know if Manchester United can afford to keep on waiting uh, for teams. It's, it's a little bit similar to Chelsea, isn't it? When we talk about managers, when we talk about players, when we talk about different way of running things. Uh, I, I do think in this crazy chaos, Chelsea are a little bit more organized. At least they they have a, a, a owner although maybe crazy to some, but that's willing to spend the money. Uh, and we all know with, uh, with Manchester United, it's kind of a little bit different. So uh, again, not beyond criticism. I think this is an important time next couple of months uh, uh, for Eric Ten Hag, because if this continues, uh, we're not going to see Eric Ten Hag uh, at, at the helm of Manchester United for sure. So let's go back to basics on how he does turn it around. Because as you said, and you mentioned what he did last season, last season I feel as though we were praising him a lot more than criticising him. And obviously as facts change, opinions do. And that's just the way it goes when we're talking football and particularly managers as well. But what does he need to do to just try and get back to basics and turn things around here? I think, you know, yeah, fundamentals. I, I mean, he, he, you know, we often talk, we don't see the identity, which is part of the issue that we're all having with him, because by now we should have seen more, uh, right? But but right now it's not about that. Just like Chelsea, you've got to win. You've got to win one or two or three games. They're not that far from top four, so let's not panic just yet, because I promise you if they win one or two straight games, you're going to see Manchester United a little bit closer to uh, where you expect them to see, because they were never favorites to win the league. 
at all. Even if things were going better for them, I I, I don't think that this this team uh, is capable of of doing that. Uh, you know, get some players back. For me, it's always an excuse. Uh, I'll give that to Chelsea. I'll give that to uh, United. I you know I gave that to Liverpool last season. Uh, no coincidence that Liverpool are doing a little bit better with some of the transfers, right, now than they were last year when they also had eight or nine or ten players. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care your name. I don't care how much, you know, the depth. When key players are missing, it's always difficult because you never have the lineup that you want to have and that you think is capable to delivering the ideas that you may may have. Uh, but, but, you know, the basics, just win games. However, at this stage, if I were Manchester United, I wouldn't be uh, looking necessarily uh, uh, for, you know, uh, style points. Uh, I would just be looking uh, for wins. For wins. <laughs> for wins. Yeah, no, so, no, just wait, wait, calm wait, the please. storm down just a little bit. And then when people stop talking about not winning the games that you're supposed to win, that's when you can build. That's when the confidence comes back. That's when the players actually want to go to the training ground instead of pulling up in the car and saying, oh, here we go again. It doesn't oh. change no matter where you are. There's a tiny little here we go again with the next topic because we do have to talk about Spurs and Liverpool in that game. And obviously we want to talk about the teams because if you do want much more in-depth talk about those VAR decisions, disasters, then there's lots of that here on our YouTube channel. But I do just want to mention VAR before we get into the teams, Janish. And I'm going to ask you, if you got the choice tomorrow to keep it or get rid of it, what would you choose? <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's impossible. I've always been against it. I see the value of it. I mean, if you can somehow improve it, I, I just think that you know, with everything that VAR, VAR brings, I mean, the soul of the game is lost, right? The spontaneity and all of that. That to me bothers me. You know, it feels to me that these days the game is more about controversy associated with, with VAR than the benefits you get you got i mean my one thing that i always wanted was the goal line technology because i mean the game's about goals and i wanted to know if the goal is in or the goal is is out but i i just think that the soul is being squeezed out by by var uh, more transparency will help that i think when you improve var but i mean how long are we going to be waiting for that right technology is going forward in every walk of life we have ai now everywhere and that seems to be happening you know every hour something's getting uh, better and yet here we are uh, with this what i will call drive for perfection in an imperfect game i mean this game is always going to be imperfect and we're looking for imper for perfection i i don't think you're going to ever accomplish that by little by little uh, i think the game is less enjoyable with all the stoppage times and all, you know, this is not about VAR in particular, but because of it as well. Now we, you, you know, we're, we're playing longer and, and all of that. So I don't know, but you know, part of me, I, I have to admit, I went to a local game, a couple of local games uh, recently where there's no VAR and every time a goal went in, I was like, I want to see that again. Uh, I don't know if I trust it. So, so I have to be honest with myself. So let's hope that we can improve it uh, somehow uh, very, very quickly. And, 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 you know, VAR has, I mean, Liverpool has all the rights to say what they have said, to want it to know, because it's massive. And it's not just for them. I hope they're fighting the fight for the benefit of everybody, right? And I hope when it happens to somebody else, they continue to press uh, PGMOL and and everybody to make this quicker, faster. If we had semi-automatic offside at the World Cup, why isn't it here? No explanation, right? This is the the richest league in the world. They should have everything that they have and others have ahead of everybody else. Yeah, they need to get their act together. Okay, I'm going to do you a few quick fires on Spurs. Are Spurs the real deal? Yes, sure, sure they are the real deal. Uh, until okay. something goes until okay. something goes wrong and it will go wrong. As far as, 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 as Premier League, are they a title threat? No, they're not. They're All not. right. Okay. They're, they're, you know, James Madison, Hummingson injured, and you look at that depth and you say, look, Ange is a great guy. 
Uh, you know, everybody's playing for him. I think the fans are happy. I think the fans are just happy to think of the possibilities, right? They're not thinking about the title. I mean, if we are here four weeks away and they're five points away from, from the top, yeah, we can have this com conversation. But, you know, they're one or two players away from losing two or three straight, and and that, that'll be that. Okay, that aside, what's Ange Postacoglu doing differently to those that came before him, Pochettino, Conte, Mourinho? I think just the positivity. You just mentioned a couple of names that I just think, you know, glass half empty, right? And and with him, you know, the glass half full. Uh, I mean, he's brought fun back, to, back into it. Uh, I can only assume that he's allowing the players to fail. He's allowing to, the players to make mistakes. He coaches through them. I would have to imagine that this is a dressing room after some of the names that I – I mentioned not that there isn't a need for that, by the way. And I think Ange is being portrayed as this, you know, lovable teddy bear, which I'm sure he's not when he needs to put his foot down because we all know that he uh, he can. Uh, but I think as a player, and you know, I hear this from you know from friends or from people that are around there, is that you know even when you make mistakes, you know when when you lose all the time, uh, there are times when you come into that dressing room the next day. And when you lose or when things don't go your way, obviously you have to start with the mistakes, right? You might have a video session where you have to point out what's went wrong. And when it happens all the time or time after time after time, it kind of, you can't help it, but it's negative. But what if the message is different? And instead of saying, this is a mistake, this is a mistake, this is a mistake, which by the way, every player knows. Every player knows. Players don't kid themselves. They just hope that it's not going to be pointed at you time and time and time again. What if a manager like that comes into dressing room, puts the arm around you, say, here, I'm going to show you how to make this better, how to make this better. The message is the same, but it's different. It's more positive. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. It's no coincidence that most of these players, you know, so on. But look at the back four. I mean, you have a new goalkeeper, a new back four. I mean, brand new, five players. I mean, some of them came from different countries. And right now you're seeing a team that's, that's. I mean, he's changed the entire team. I mean, even that midfield, right? Bisuma, we know, obviously, last season injury comes in. Looks the part. Saar, I mean, young player, comes in. Hoybier sits on the bench. Here's Hoybier, who played just about, I think there was a season, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, where he's missed a minute. Maybe not even a minute, right? And now he's ha he has to come from the bench and do his job. And I'm, I promise you, he probably doesn't love it, because from a player that played every second of every game just about, He's on the bench, but he's still doing the part. Now, ultimately, he may leave. He almost left before the season. But while he's there, somehow he still contributes, right? Usually good coaches yeah. have a way of finding that. Yeah, and so far he's proven to be a very good coach, particularly at the club that he's landed at. Now, let's talk about who's shown themselves to be a very good player so far in the Premier League. We have asked you for your top five players from what we've seen so far in the Premier League, we will be starting back to front. So tell us who you've got at number five. Number five, I, I've changed that many times. And there's like two or three <laughs> others on the sidelines. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect, but I'll try. And, and you know, uh, uh, Mo Salah, uh, such an important, could have been uh, much higher uh, without him. I mean, look at this Liverpool, maybe scoring less than away from the run of play, but involved in just about every goal Liverpool scores and in every dangerous situation. So he continues to be, uh, uh, in my opinion, absolutely superb with this newer team, if you will. Uh, at four, I put uh, Erling Haaland because even though, I mean, imperfect, all players are, uh, still eight goals out there, still very, very important. Uh, at number three, I put Human Son because I just love uh, what he's done, something that I, I felt that he would do. Uh, I mean, after that season when he finished up with Mo Salah uh, in terms of scoring charts. And in my opinion, that year, he was the best player in the Premier League, even though Mo Salah won it. Uh, you know, last year, yeah, I didn't put too much into it. Uh, I, I knew that he hasn't lost it, so I, I'm happy uh, that he's proven me right here. Uh, number two, uh, Odegaard. Uh, incredible. I continue to watch him. I continue to question myself how good he truly is, and he's exceptional, right? And, and if we're going to be going bananas about Jude Bellingham at Real Madrid, just imagine if Real Madrid had the patience and maybe – 
you know, uh, no, I don't want to say know how, but could foresee and stick with him where Odegaard would have been because I think he's exceptional for a playmaker, superb, superb every game, uh, such an important part of this Arsenal team, uh, arguably the most important part, uh, uh, you know, the, the heart and soul or the brains at the very least of Arsenal. And and at number one, I have Rodri because I always have Rodri at number one. So I'm not going to explain it. Um, because he is, to me, an exceptional, exceptional player. All right. Nice to see. No love for Sabozlai so far with what you've seen? In the I'll get to it. The best is yet to come. And at least, you know, I mean, soft spot for him for a long time. Uh, I don't need to explain that. I think the best is yet to come. Ali Watkins uh, was very, very close because, uh, uh, you know, scoring goals is very important uh, for this Villa project. Uh, James Madison, I really had a hard time pushing him out of there. It really, if somebody makes a case that Madison should be there over Son or, how, you know, so, fair play. I mean, those three players were kind of next. I mean, they're, they're about, which, you know what, if I put it there, I'd, I'd be at peace with myself. <laughs>